Hi, I'm Ian Ramsey, and I'll be reading Tim Fox's piece, Radical Homing. It starts with an epigraph from Terry Tempest Williams from An Unspoken Hunger. The epigraph is, it just may be the most radical act we can commit is to stay home. Radical Homing by Tim Fox. The sound of surging water grows louder with each step I take down the trail to the bank of Horse Creek, 10 minutes walk from my house. I've taken this walk through the grove of big leaf maples, red alders, western red and incense cedars almost every day this August. Maybe today the salmon will be back. I near a waterline and listen for unusual rhythms in the creek music, riffing salmon tails strumming liquid strings. At the crest of a rise above a narrow sandy beach, I stop and gaze 30 feet across into the clear current that slides along the far shore, passing over spring Chinook salmon reds from years past. A lone female, the first of the year, drifts in the shallows. She is given away by her flaring dorsal fin, already yellowing with decay. After a few minutes, a great humpbacked male, over a foot longer, slides in beside her. Their massive bodies loom in the current, shimmering periodically as they commence a procreative dance that has been repeated year after year for millennia. A dance with water, gravel, milt, and eggs. The female tilts on her side, whip fans her tail, billowing silt and stones from the creek bed to form a bowl. Then she hunkers low within it, and the male sensing the imminent release of eggs, sidles in just ahead of her and to the right. He shudders. The water clouds momentarily, then clears. Hundreds of lives begin. The pair relaxes and soon the female fans again, this time covering their offspring with stones to protect them from the fast winter currents and hungry cutthroat trout. At one time, I would have felt compelled like a scoreboard birder checking some new species off a life list to see at the dance once, add it to my tally of experiences, and head off in search of the next novelty. But as time passed, I found myself, like a salmon, returning again and again. While I watch the salmon, I think about the years it has taken for me to become aware of these creek tales, let alone try to read them. As a member of an Air Force family, I was relocated seven times before my 12th birthday. It felt as if I had been browsing through a bookstore, moving from volume to volume, fast enough to make out the jacket art and imaginative titles, but too fast to crack open a volume. My first couple of years in the Oregon Cascades after attending college in Wyoming fit a familiar pattern. Stunned by the beauty of this green, glaciered, mountainous landscape, I set out with a camera and began filling my scorecard. It was bliss for a time. But then, after I had checked off all the big sights, I didn't leave. This brought about a paradoxical feeling, an unsettled break with a routine that depended on periodic geographic displacement for a sense of stability. Between my third and sixth years in the state, I felt increasingly adrift. I re-photographed the wonders, but couldn't regain the original thrill, even when the light was better, when the scene was more dramatic. Then I noticed the salmon. I became captivated by them and returned often to see them throughout the fall, year after year, with an eagerness that didn't wane and was richer than the earlier thrills. I had opened a book and was beginning to read. Salmon travel great distances as I once did, but if a map of their experience journeys could be made, there would be a glaring difference from a map of mine. The features of their map would have an organic flow, a continuity. Mine would be an indecipherable mash of disjunct topographic islands collected from numerous watersheds in dozens of states and two different continents, all abutted to form a mapscape for which there is no corresponding landscape. Until I began my salmon vigils, 
such a map was all I had to go by. When I tried to understand my place in the land, I was consequently bewildered. The salmon showed me how to perceive the map gaps and then how to begin to fill them in. They taught me about a kind of travel that might be called radical homing. Radical homing may sound dissonant, but it's really more like a redundancy. The origin of the word radical is radic, which means root. Radical is a word so thoroughly at home with itself, it serves as its own linguistic soil. Radical homing represents the turning of the pages of time in one space and has led me to move around less in a physical sense, but to feel more moved by what I experience. It's a kind of time traveling in home waters. Single geographic locations literally become different places with each passing moment, places with the added depth of personal familiarity and involvement. The seasons of life in one place bring me thrills, as well as the deeper meanings that move with the cycles of the year. The spawning of the salmon in autumn, snow-dusted hemlocks in winter, trillium blossoms in spring, a glimpse of a white speckled fawn in summer. These all come to me as firsts, even though I have seen them again and again over the quarter century since I opened the book. The span between each return is sufficient to rekindle its newness and whet my appetite to keep reading. This time of isolation is a time for radical homing, an opportunity to learn our place in a world that won't let us go our separate ways, not only in our empowerment, but also in our vulnerability. We are reminded that we belong.